Hi, my name is Elizabeth Sinjin, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Friends of Lydia Park to our historic heroine series. We had hoped to bring this to you live from Lydia, but of course travel restrictions precluded us from that this year. So we decided to venture into the online world. And I'm very proud to uh, welcome you again today to our historic heroine series. I'm going to share my screen with you. Uh, I've got a whole wonderful collection of portraits, photographs and images of uh, my particular historic heroine today. Her name is Anne St. John, and she's the daughter of the first baronet. Uh, so I was born in Lydia in the 17th century. So bear with me while I share my screen and then we'll run through um, my lecture and then I'll come back on in the end and just let you know where you can perhaps find some more information. So let's see if I can get over there without too much technical difficulty. There we go. And again, welcome on behalf of the Friends to Historic Heroines. So as I mentioned, today we're going to be talking about Anne Wilmot, who was born and singed at Lydiard. But there are also other remarkable women who lived at the same time as her, who were relatives, who were cousins, Lydia children, I like to think. And they also had a great impact on history. I call them the women of the shadow court, because of course, women in those days did not have a formal role <clears throat> in politics. Um, and so they worked behind the scenes. And Lucy Hutchinson, who was a committed, <clears throat> excuse me, a committed Puritan, uh, was an extraordinary writer. Barbara Villas, of course, is uh, known by her reputation as being King Charles II's mistress. And Anne Wilmot, who herself was an extraordinary negotiator and a very ambitious woman for her family, um, was married to Henry Wilmot, the king's best friend. So behind the scenes, these women had an extraordinary impact on history in the 17th century. We're going to explore that a little bit more today. They are the subject of my trilogy of novels called the Lydiard Chronicles. And I had great pleasure in writing this series and working with the Friends of Lydiard Park and a number of other organizations who helped me with some amazing research. So some of the work that I'll be bringing to you today is as a result of the research that perhaps I couldn't include everything in my books, but I'm eager to share some of those stories with you. And let's begin where I began, which is the extraordinary diaries and notebooks of a woman called Lucy Apsley, Lucy Hutchinson, as she's known by her married name. She was born in the Tower of London uh, to Lucy St. John, and she was born there in 1620. She became an extraordinarily committed Puritan um, and is absolutely renowned for her eyewitness account, the diaries that she kept of the English Civil War. And she kept those notebooks and diaries and then eventually just transcribed them into a memoir that she wrote about her husband's life, Colonel John Hutchinson. And we'll be learning more about him throughout, um, throughout the talk today. But let me just share a little bit of Lucy's words with you. This is to take you back to the day that she was born uh, in the Tower of London. And she wrote, it was on the 29th day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1620, that in the Tower of London, the principal city of the English Isle, I was about four o'clock of the morning, brought forth to behold the ensuing light. My father was Sir Alan Apsley, Lieutenant of the Tower of London. And for any of you who are familiar with my novels, The Lady of the Tower uh, really does go through Lucy St. John's uh, position within the tower. She lived there for 13 years and gave birth to Lucy Apsley within the tower. So an extraordinary life and an extraordinary resource uh, for the family knowledge. So as I mentioned, uh, these women that we'll be uh, talking about today are all St. John descendants. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, this beautiful portrait within the polyptych, which is uh, located within St. Mary's Church at Lydia Park. It's a life-size, uh, beautiful painting that was done in the early 1600s of the first baronet, 
his wife Anne, commemorating his parents, uh, figures in the middle there, and including his six sisters. Um, and from those six sisters came the children, Lucy Hutchinson, Barbara Villas, who was a granddaughter of Eleanor, excuse me, a granddaughter of Barbara, and um, Anne Wilmot, who of course was the daughter of John and Anne. So we're going to talk a little bit um, about Anne herself now. She was an extraordinarily uh, purposeful and ambitious woman. She was born at Lydiard, and when she lived there, she would have recognized uh, the medieval back of Lydia. She wouldn't have seen this beautiful Palladium front that exists today. But she would have seen herself depicted as a child on her father's tomb, this beautiful little marble effigy of her as a, as a daughter still exists today. I have to confess, when I first started exploring Anne's history and considering writing about her in my novels, I almost stopped because she described Lydiard as that dull place. And it's one of my favorite places in the world. So I thought, mm, Anne, I'm not sure I'm going to like you. But she is a compelling woman with an extraordinary voice. And uh, I, I managed to get over that opinion and uh, really researched her life and enjoyed getting to know her. She preferred the liveliness of Battersea the St. John family home up um, in, near London. And when she was there, she met and fell in love with the Lee head, family Lee. And they lived in Chelsea, and she actually then married into the Lee family, which was of great honor. Unfortunately, she also uh, encountered a very, very difficult woman, her mother-in-law, Eleanor Lee who absolutely despised the St. John family and despised Anne um, as an ardent royalist. royalist. Eleanor, whose portrait is here in the center, um, was a very strong parliamentarian. So it was, I think, a very difficult situation for Anne to arrive into, newly married, very young still, I think she was only about 18. Um, but she had a great love for her husband and um, moved to Ditchley Park this is a, a sketch of the Elizabethan house um, as it existed then, moved to Ditchley Park. It was a great honor. The famous Ditchley portrait of Elizabeth I, which I feature here on the left, uh, commemorated the value that the Lee family had to Elizabeth and how proud they were of that association. In fact, if you look at this portrait and you look at her toes, Elizabeth's toes, they're actually on a map of Oxfordshire pointing to Ditchley. So back to Anne and her extraordinarily strong voice. Um, I like to share this amazing letter that I found that's at the University of Rochester in New York. There's a great collection of letters there of hers and her voice starts to emerge and you'll start to hear um, the strength of this extraordinary woman who guided the, the fortune of her family um, throughout her life. She was widowed very young. Her beloved husband died of smallpox and she was left to raise her two small sons and make sure that she could hang on to the inheritance of Ditchley for them. So already uh, she encountered a lot of um, very difficult situations young in life. But I'm going to read to you here an excerpt of a letter that she wrote in her older years to her grandson. And she's writing about uh, his brother, her other grandson, who perhaps made a marriage that she didn't approve of. So listen to Anne's voice for a moment. April, 1685. Your unfortunate brother, Frank Lee, was here to see me yesterday and brought his wife, which in my opinion is a very plain woman, not such a one as to make a man run the hazard of his ruin by her. I confess they were a melancholy, melancholy sight for me, and I believe they discerned it, for Frank never invited them to me as much as one night. Some little discourse I had with him, but nothing to my satisfaction, for he gave me little answer to what I asked him. I asked him whether his mother and his friends liked what he had done. He told me he believed not. I asked him how he meant to live 
He said he didn't know. I asked him whether he had a great portion with his wife. He said, no, he had a very little one, but a thousand pounds. I told him, I wondered that he took no friend's advice before he did so rash an action, marrying this woman. He gave me no answer to that at all. I told him he was undone. He said nothing to that neither, but I discerned tears were in his eyes. So I said no more afterwards before he went away. I saw him frown and doggedly, but said not as much as to ask me for my blessing. And so we parted. So I wouldn't actually want to be at the receiving end of Anne's wrath, as you can uh, hear there. She was not happy with the marriage that her grandson made. That strength of character became very much to the forefront of her life when the English Civil War broke out. Anne was um, a young widow and she was a fervent royalist. And at that point, at the Battle of Edge Hill, which was the first really major conflict of the Civil War, she was already smuggling arms past the parliamentarians to support her cousin, Alan, who was her dear, dear, dear beloved cousin, and Sir Edward Hyde, who was another family relative, a distant relative of the St. John's. So Ditchley Park became right under parliamentarian mother-in-law Eleanor's nose, Ditchley Park became a refuge for the Royalists. And it was at that time, don't know exactly when, that Anne also met Henry Wilmot, who was to become her second husband. Again, a fervent, um, exuberant Royalist, quite a character. Um, someone that it was hard to reconcile, perhaps, this very businesslike, determined, strongly opinionated woman um, with this sort of ne'er-do-well uh, royalist cavalier. But they did meet, and I think they did fall in love and married shortly thereafter. But as I said, meantime, Anne was starting to form uh, a royalist network. She had good cause to. During the Civil War, uh, she encountered great tragedy. Three of her brothers died in the cause. William, um, who was the eldest brother, who was on, who's here on the left-hand side. Edward, who's commemorated in Lydia Church at St. Mary's, and her brother John. So she was became a fervent uh, royalist, as I said, and um, always played sort of this extraordinary dual role. She had an incredibly incisive brain. She was very smart but she also played along as sort of the helpless female. Um, she would send venison pie to Sir Edward on the front lines, just proclaiming that, um, you know, I'm a simple housewife and I thought you might like some pie to keep you going. Whereas at the same time, she was um, running rings around the parliamentarians who were trying to sequester Ditchley Park and trying to take it from her. At the same time, of course, she had this extraordinary family dynamic on, going on. Lucy's dearest cousin, um, uh, sorry, Anne's dearest cousin, Lucy Hutchinson, uh, was a very, very close to her. And she, of course, married John Hutchinson, who was a, a fervent parliamentarian. Uh, this portrait of Lucy and John is one of my favorites. It's actually in the National Army Museum. And it was recently bestowed there by Sir Elton John, who, who gave it to the museum. It doesn't have 100% provenance that it's Lucy and John, but we're pretty sure it is. And I'd like to just bring your attention here to the remarkable lacework on Lucy's clothing beautiful embroidery. They were based in Nottingham. John was governor of Nottingham Castle during the Civil War. And of course, that was the center of the lace making trade in the 17th century. So again, these, this couple, which would have been a very typical Puritan couple, uh, really do belie that impression that they were dour and, and um, soberly dressed. They obviously had their finery as well. And that brings me to John's um, extraordinary red crimson coat here. And that's another reason that we think this truly were, these truly were portraits of them. Luce, Lucy makes mention in her notebooks of John going to Westminster dressed in his crimson coat. 
So I rather like that connection. She was very much in love with him uh, and especially loved his long, lustrous chestnut hair that, of course, is beautifully depicted in this portrait. So again, during the Civil War, then, Anne's loyalties were split. She definitely uh, was, as they say, a fervent royalist, but she also supported and stayed very close to her beloved cousin, Lucy. As I said, they were at Nottingham Castle. Um, John very much um, believed in the parliamentarian cause, but did not have a lot of respect for Cromwell. And there is a number of incidents throughout uh, the memoirs that show John's uh, really distaste for Cromwell, which grew uh, as Cromwell became more powerful and formed the protectorate. So there was this sort of, not necessarily an ambivalence, but definitely um, a conflict that John had within. He, he totally espoused the parliamentarian cause and, and belay, believed in, in the rights of the common man. Um, but at the same time, I think he still realized that, that his family and the royalist collection was an important part of his life too. It came to a point, of course, um, at the Civil War where the uh, regicides put to death Charles I. Um, they signed his execution warrant after a very public trial. It was a foregone conclusion, of course. They felt that they could do nothing but uh, execute him. They felt that he had um, sort of called against his own people. And so John signed the death warrant for Charles I. And you can see his signature here indicated by the arrow. I think it was a difficult decision for him at first, but he did attend every, every day of the trial. And he was very convinced that the king uh, needed to be executed. Uh, and many of the parliamentarians in power did not show up to actually sign the warrant itself. John did, and it was to come back and haunt him. So the execution of Charles I took place and then basically ushered in the Commonwealth. This, of course, created a huge schism within the country. Charles II, the, the king's son, fled to the continent and took up um, residence in France, and with him went a number of royalists and the St. John family. The, uh, the king took up residence in Paris. This is the, the Louvre Palace, as it was in Charles II's time. And with him and accompanied him were Nan's cousin, Sir Alan Apsley, and his wife, Frances, and of course, Henry Wilmot and Edward Hyde. So they set up what was essentially court, an exile court, in Paris and from then started to really think about how they could come home again, how they could restore the monarchy. Because meanwhile, of course, back in England, Cromwell had taken power. And back in England, Anne was still very much defending Ditchley Park, keeping it safe, keeping it secure for her children. And at the same time, now starting to really set up a network of informants that could send back information to the court in exile, her husband, Henry Wilmot, to see how they could bring the king back. Uh, there were, I, I think court at that time in Paris must have been a really hard place. They had absolutely no money. They were crammed together um, in really difficult conditions and rumors and gossip were flying. At one point even, uh, the rumor circulated that Alan Apsley was the father of the notorious John Wilmot and son by Henry. Just a rumor, but it was just one of those things that were flying around um, that caused Anne and Alan great distress. But as I said, meanwhile, Anne was back in England at Ditchley and staying very much in touch with her parliamentarian youngest brother, Walter, heir to Lydiard, and his wife, Joanna, who was very closely related to Oliver Cromwell. So she had this extraordinary uh, dual um, personality going on outwardly, um, uh, 
she was uh, conforming to all of the demands by Parliament, but secretly she was gathering information and sending back um, important details on Parliament positions to the exiled court in Paris. Interestingly enough, many of the women who were distributing and passing information were um, Catholic. They had left England under fear of persecution and the convents in Paris and, and throughout France and, and present day Belgium served almost as clearing houses for correspondence that was going on. Uh, so Anne and, and Francis Apsley, Anne's wife, definitely set up um, a network and a correspondence so that they could report back to the exiled court exactly what was going on in England. Because it was critical, of course, for the exiled court to try and understand where the strengths and weaknesses were of the parliamentarians, of the, of the current rulers. And Edward Hyde, again, a St. John cousin, was in charge of that whole spy network. He was really um, coordinating all of those efforts. So I think he and Anne, Francis, Alan, we see their names crop up in secret correspondence, were definitely part of that network. It formalized um, under the King's approval a little bit later during the exile, during the interregnum. And that sort of um, informal network became formalized as the sealed knot. And the sealed knot itself uh, comprised actually of a number of St. John family um, at that time, both in England and in France. The um, reason that the sealed knot didn't succeed was it was still very difficult for it to really substantially organize. And they certainly tried. It was a secret association. They had a number of uprisings that they coordinated um, during the Civil War. And they think it was actually 10 attempts formally to bring about the restoration of Charles II between 1652 and 1659. And Alan and Henry Wilmot and Edward Hyde were very much a part of that sealed knot activity. In fact, Alan wrote to King Charles from when he was back in England at one point, saying that he was so impatient to do service as a metalled hawk still baiting to be gone. Um, a rather nice insight into Alan's character there. Um, he actually became the master of the king's hawks. And I, I love that uh, analogy that he brings himself to that personality of a hawk as he was writing to the king. And the women, of course, were still involved. Lucy was uh, very much aware of what her sister, uh, sorry, what her cousin was doing. And um, Barbara Villas was now starting to emerge as a personality of her own. So the Penruddock uprising was one of the major uprisings. It, it should have been a success. It should have gone really well. There was definitely a lot of planning went into it. And Henry Wilmot, in one of his numerous disguises, uh, came into England and really was it was his job to try and coordinate all of the efforts and lead the uprising. Unfortunately, communications were terrible. Um, a double agent from Cromwell gave away the plot and Henry Wilmot and his followers uh, were basically found out and the uprising was stopped. Uh, some of the followers were executed on the spot when they were discovered. Henry managed to escape and made his way south and took refuge with John and Lucy Hutchinson. So to think of that for a moment, here is the leader of the uprising in charge of restoring um, Charles II to the throne, and he takes refuge with one of Cromwell's main leaders, John Hutchinson, at his manor house at Althorpe. So family was definitely the number one uh, priority. And at that point, uh, because of, of John's relationship with Lucy, we hear that they actually hid Henry Wilmot at Althorpe. 
before he was able to then carry on and escape safely back to the, the continent right under Cromwell's nose. Shortly after that, uh, Cromwell died. And we know that although he had nominated his son to carry on as protector, that was not a success. His son did not have the power or the charisma or the strength to hold the uh, protectorate together. And in 1660, the king had negotiated with Fairfax to come back to England and be restored as the monarch. During that time, during those months leading up to the restoration in 1616, the uh, royalists who were in England started flooding to the continent because they knew that, that the restoration was coming and they wanted to be first in line um, as part of this grand return to England that Charles was, was organizing. And one of those couples that went was Roger Palmer and his young wife, Barbara Villas. Uh, it was really interesting. Already, uh, she was creating quite a stir uh, in society as being this extraordinarily beautiful and alluring young woman. And on the eve of the rest of restoration, Charles was told to look out for his courtier, Roger Palmer, for he had a gay wife, great expenses, and a slender fortune. So I wonder if that sort of tells you reading between the lines that perhaps um, he might be open to some uh, honors and uh, a little bit of income in returning for turning or in return for turning a blind eye on his wife's activities. We know that Barbara Villas became mistress to the king um, at, uh, at The Hague on the eve of his restoration much to the great disgust and, and uh, anguish of Edward Hyde, who felt that she was letting down the family. And so they all came back to England with Barbara Villa's a St. John cousin firmly ensconced as Charles II's mistress. Charles, of course, on his restoration, immediately wanted to seek revenge for those men who had executed, murdered his father. And so one of the first things that he started to do was to track down those regicides and bring them um, forward. And frankly, in some cases, execute them without even a trial, just completely wanted to, to bring down all of those men who had killed his father. So suddenly John was in great danger. He of course was one of the signatories and at that point, Anne leapt into action. And it's quite extraordinary what she did here. She immediately started assessing who the political influences were, who could possibly impact Charles's decision. There was perhaps an opportunity for a pardon rather than a summary execution. And she immediately started working all of her political contacts to try and save John's life. And the way that she did this was to put together, frankly, uh, a group, a coordinated group of men who would speak to John's um, loyalty to the royalist cause. So she wrote a letter, signed it herself, uh, which was really putting her own political capital on the line and uh, in, in sort of invoked others to sign on her behalf. So let me write now uh, the pleading that Anne put forward to try and save John's life. She wrote this in June, 1616. This is to certify that about seven years ago and from time to time ever since, Colonel Hutchinson hath declared his desire of the King's Majesty's return to his kingdoms and his own resolution to assist in bringing his Majesty back. And in order thereunto hath kept a correspondence with some of us when designs have been on foot for that purpose, and hath upon all occasions been ready to assist and protect the king's friends in any of their troubles and to employ all his interests to serve them. He gave the Earl of Rochester notice and opportunity to escape when Cromwell's ministers had discovered him the last time he was employed in his majesty's service here in England. He received into his house and secured there 
arms prepared for the king's service, well knowing to what intent they were provided and resolving to join us when there had been occasion to use them. And she wrote, she signed that along with Alan Apsley, Edward Villers, George Grandison, Alan Broderick, key men who were key friends and allies of Charles II that she invoked to put their names to this plea for John Hutchinson. Remarkably persuasive, if you can think of, of that. At the same time, she persuaded Barbara Villa, Charles's now mistress, of course, to send her husband, Roger, who was, of, of course, still a strong uh, royalist supporter, to plea for John's life in front of Parliament. And off Roger went, um, and there's an extraordinary record of him asking for John's life to be saved. So all of this being uh, coordinated by Anne behind the scenes to save her beloved cousin's husband. They were successful. John was pardoned. He was uh, stripped of all of his uh, wealth and house and, uh, well, actually belongings. He was allowed to keep the house up in Althorpe. And he retired very quietly to the countryside um, and maintained a very quiet presence there. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't good enough for the Duke of Buckingham. The Duke of Buckingham was a, a, an extraordinarily volatile character and was determined still to continue to hunt down those regicides on behalf of the king and concocted a plot uh, several years later in which he named John Hutchinson as the leader. And on that strength of, of Buckingham's accusation, John was thrown into the Tower of London, much to the distress, as you can imagine, of Lucy, and was kept there for quite some time in the bloody tower. And I can only think of what a, a horrific full circle Lucy's life had become. She was born in the tower. She was brought up there. Her family was very closely associated with it as keepers. And um, then she was back there visiting her husband who was kept there under terrible circumstances. It was thought at that point that John may be uh, deported overseas to Tangier. She would never see him again. And it was, must have been an extraordinarily difficult time when they thought that perhaps um, that was all behind them was brought to the forefront. Unfortunately, despite the family's greatest efforts, John's health was poor. And from the tower, he was transferred to Sandown Castle in Kent, where he subsequently died. Uh, Lucy brought back his body to Althorpe, to his beloved home, which he, he loved more than any place on earth. And he was buried uh, in the church there with this beautiful inscription that she wrote herself, uh, saying that he was kept in harsh and strict imprisonment without crime or accusation. She was always convinced that she had and would continue to clear his name. Um, and so he remains there um, in the church along with his beloved Lucy and Lucy St. John, who is also buried there. So what of Anne and her continuing uh, extraordinary management of the family and its wealth and its future? As I said, she hung on to Ditchley throughout the Civil War. Uh, it's a lovely expression, actually, that she managed to wrap the assets of the house and her business dealings in so much red tape that she befuddled Cromwell's investigators and was never able to uh, allow them to grab the house and, and its assets. Uh, the house today still stands. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, new house that was built in the early 18th century and is the home today of the Ditchley Foundation. And I'd just like to say how incredibly grateful I am to the foundation and um, its management for all the help that they gave me and the research that I have done over the years with Anne's life there. Um, the Ditchley Foundation itself has an extraordinary mission. Um, its statement is to work with people from across the world to help sustain peace, freedom, and order. And I like to think that, that uh, Anne would have approved of that. 
her con connection and her relationship with the very influential Barbara Villas continued throughout her life. And in true Anne style, she uh, not only continued that relationship, she arranged and negotiated a marriage contract with one of Barbara Villas, Charles II's daughters. Uh, she contracted on her 10th birthday, the daughter, Lady Charlotte Fitzroy, to marry Anne's grandson, Sir Edward Lee. And they were married on the 6th of September, uh, 6th of February, 1677, um, and put a, a dowry of 18,000 um, pounds, or accepted that dowry of 18,000 pounds from Charlotte. And uh, so they uh, actually had, I think, a very happy marriage, of course, although it was arranged, um, and together had 18 children. But again, just an extraordinary um, insight into Anne's ongoing uh, management of the family and the influence that she had. One final very special note about Anne is that when Lucy wrote her notebooks and her diaries and the memoir of her husband, which is now regarded, frankly, as one of the most extraordinary eyewitness accounts of the English Civil War, None of those were published in her lifetime. They were much too, um, much too incendiary in many ways. And so they remained hidden with Lucy Hutchinson. And upon her death, she entrusted them to Anne. They were found upon Anne's death, hidden in her belongings. And so even at the very end, you see this parliamentarian royalist trust between the two women um, and, and family being the number one important thing in their lives. Um, the memoirs were subsequently published and uh, I'm really excited to see that uh, the originals themselves will be on display at Nottingham Castle when that reopens, hopefully in the summer of 2021, um, in conjunction with a worldwide symposium on Lucy's diaries. So again, thank you for coming today. Uh, this is again, just been an extraordinary voyage of exploration and listening to these women's voices and finding out more about them. Uh, there is more details on the website here at uh, the Friends of Lydia Park. So do feel free to come onto the website, um, enjoy um, exploring, finding out more about them and about the work that we're doing at the Friends. Uh, and again, I, I really hope that you enjoyed spending a little bit of time with my historic heroine and Sinjin Wilmot. Thank you so much for coming.